assist today by Ashin McManus, who is one of our key stage two coaches. Um, Ashin has been employed with us now for since last July, and he's one of the coaches out in the ground and in the schools. Um, probably for seven or eight years, I was in round coaching in primary schools as well. So between the two of us, hopefully we'll be able to deliver a, a good course for you today. So, the aims of the Ulster GA Teacher in Service Training. So over the next four weeks, you've probably seen the email, we're going to run four live webinars over the next four Wednesdays, um, and the modules are as follows. An introduction to games, how to effectively plan a session, tricks of the trade, and cross-curricular links, so how to develop a theme in your PE lesson. Um, there'll be four different presenters each week, and after the session today, probably by tomorrow evening, we will email you the Eventbrite links that you can hopefully register for the rest of the three modules at once, and then we'll obviously just be to communicate um, sign-ins and that sort of stuff as we go. Just be, be reminded that they are all live and they are all being recorded. By the end of this session, hopefully you'll be able to identify, identify different types of games, identify key factors that can be used to alter a game, and at the end of it, organize games for primary school children in a PE context. So, quick task for us. In the chat box, can you answer this question? How can games be used in a PE context? So in the chat box there, if you could, I'll give you a minute there. How can games be used in a PE context? Remember, all the names are down the right, so I might have to pinpoint someone here to ask them for an answer. Okay, that's brilliant. Lots of great answers coming through there. So, games could be used in a PE context, um, I say probably for uh, all of the things you've already alluded to in, in your chat there, which is excellent. It can be used for warm-up, so we can have fun games throughout our warm-up. So, uh, as a PE teacher, as a coach, probably one of the first things that you're going to be asked by a child is, can we have a game? So why not give them a game and a warm-up? It'll energize the kids, it's fun. And probably that has to be the main emphasis that it is fun, but it can also set the tone for the rest of your lesson. As as said in the chat, it can be used for skill development. So, do we do we do we practice skills in isolation, or do we practice our skills and develop our skills through games? Playing them through games, you're playing them opposed. You're putting your kids under pressure, which you're going to hope is is going to develop them more. Again, said a couple of times, it's used for decision making, which is key in terms of building better players. One thing I would say a lot when I'm coaching, especially working with um, kids from sort of four to 10 year old, the child and the child strand is one of our roles as a coach is to create thinking players and how we do this is through games. You know, if, if we're still putting kids in lines, is that giving the child any sense of decision making at all? It's probably not. You're telling them what to do. Um, so, one of the things that we can keep in mind is that we're trying to create thinking players. Games can be used for engaging, challenging children. I'm going to say challenging children. It's the boisterous child, maybe the child that's hyperactive or they're coming into the hall and they just can't wait to get going. We put that child in a line or we give that child too many instructions. What happens? They may become even more challenging. 
we give them a game, we keep them engaged and we keep them active, generally you tend to find that that settles them and, and they will become, they, they do engage with it. Games can be used for building resilience and character. So by this we mean in terms of winning and losing, probably with society these days, kids are maybe mollycoddled a wee bit more than than um, the, the older years and um, you know they're used to getting what they want. But through through games and through learning how to win and lose, it will help them build character and, and show resilience. And then use for developing creativity. Okay, so I just want you to raise your hand on the on the chat bar. I want you to put the thumb up. If you've ever went into your PE lesson and you've asked to put the kids into groups of twos or threes, give them equipment and ask them to make up a game. So if you've ever tried that approach, just ask the children to make up their own game. Just put a, put your hand up or the thumb up there in the text box. Okay, that's brilliant. So there's quite a few of these have tried that have tried that approach, which for me is a, a lot of the stuff at the key stage one um, age group is is how we should be trying to play our game. So put your kids in twos or threes, give them a piece of equipment or let them select their own piece of equipment, be it a football, a couple of cones, a bib or whatever equipment you do have, and ask them to come up with a game. Okay, throughout that time then, they have the opportunity to, to be creative, they have the opportunity to explore, and there is a massive amount of learning taking place for the kids throughout that time. As a coach saying, or as, as a PE teacher, what, what are we doing throughout that time? Are you just standing back with your arms folded watching them? Or are you going around and are you questioning the kids as in what game they're playing and setting them challenging questions? How could they make the game a little bit more difficult? Could they introduce a scoring system? What rules are there? Who's made up the rules? So all different ways that if you give the children that bit of unstructured time and that bit of time to come up with their own ideas, you will find that can go a long way to setting the tone in your session and, and maybe have the session flow with, with that way. So it's definitely a great, it's a great thing to use um, how to use games in your PE lesson. Okay, so Types of games, um, th there's five types of games that we're going to explain today and we're going to give you examples of and question you through. So down the left hand side you'll see the, the, tactic, the technical name, be it a target game, court game, field game, non-invasion game and a full invasion game. And then a layman's explanation where a target game is a game you have to have a target to aim at or hit. A court game, a game that you're required to pass a ball over a net or zone to a teammate or opposition team. A field game, a game based on alternating the player kicking, striking or fielding the ball. A non-invasion game, a game that requires you to work as part of a team without any direct opposition. And a full invasion game, a full rules game that have diff different conditions set. So if you just want to re-read it that for a bit on your own. Okay. Now, so what we're going to do, we're going to give you 10 or 11 examples of different games today. We're going to talk through the games and then throughout this, we're going to try and engage with you and ask you different questions throughout this. So just in the text box, have a look at the diagram, have a look at the game, and can you write down what type of game you think this is? So from, from the terms on the slide before, what type of game do you think this one is? Okay. 
Okay, so we've we've a lot of people coming in here with a court game. So this game will be likened to as a target game. So you're trying to hit a partner. So if we go back to the slide before, target game is a game where you have a target to aim or hit at. The target in this case is your partner. So in this activity, it's a 1v1. They're playing cooperatively. Um, you'll see the rules how to play. Two sets of domes, one ball between two, and they can send the ball whatever they, way they want, be it with their hand, with their foot. This game can also be used for striking, striking with a hand, a bat, a hurl, or whatever, may, whatever it may be. How to make um, this game turn into a competition? How many successful passes can you make in 20 seconds? How many? How, what's the first team to get to 10 passes, or whatever that may be? How to make it harder, how to make it easier? If you just have a read, read through them bullet points yourself. And then probably the most important part then is our coaching points. So we're coaching the head, hands, and the feet. So very simply, the ball's coming towards the, the child. The instruction is keep your eyes on the ball. When they're sending the ball, hands at the back of the ball, and then they roll. When they're receiving the ball, they scoop the ball up with big hands into their chest and their feet. They're standing with their legs shoulder shoulder width apart. Now, we're going to progress this game on. So the two the two guys in the picture are going to roll the ball to each other, and then there's another set of gates at a different area in the hall, and they have to run to those sets of gates. What problems do you think may arise when you ask the children to do that? So in the text box there. So they have to pass the ball through to each other as the diagram shows. And then once the second player picks up the ball, both people have to go and find a different set of gates to throw the ball through. What problems may arise? Okay, so health and safety. All run into the same set of gates. Okay. Brilliant. So lots of great answers there in terms of children will bump into each other, yes. So as a coach, what are we looking for? We're looking to assess their spatial awareness. We're looking to see are they competent in moving with their head up? What are their evasion skills like? Are they able to avoid other people? Um, there will be that problem when they get to the gate. There might be somebody else there. And then the questions start, I got here first, no, I got here first. As a coach or a P in, in, in the P context, how do we fix it? We question them. Do you see a, uh, do you see a free set of goals? Can you move to there? Um, they may lose their partner, as somebody has said here, which is, which is good. So a condition that you could set on this activity is the person with the ball decides what gate to go to. So they're sharing, they're having to work on the communication skills. Somebody stated here, the technique may be less effective as they may, may concentrate in more in getting to the next gate. That's a very valid point. That will be the case, but obviously, hopefully with repetition, that, that may improve. And through this game, we're not, actually, we're not actually setting a task as to how you send the ball. So a child maybe who is only able to roll the ball, they roll it, whilst a child who can maybe hand pass the ball, they can hand pass the ball. So you, you have a lot of differentiation in this game as well, you're catering for all abilities. Okay, so the next game here, just again, quick task, what type of game do you think this is? So from the five games we listed earlier, what type of game do you think this is? Okay, so again, we have a lot of answers again already, which is brilliant. Thanks for engaging. So it's a fee game, yep. So this game is, okay, fee game. So continuous rounders, um, 
a great game to play if um, if you haven't played it in school, I suppose the traditional way of playing rounders was having two teams, a class of 30, 15 against 15 and have 14 people lined up behind a cone and one person gets to bat the ball and by the time it comes to person 14, the lesson's over. Um, so again, it's a, it's a 1v1 situation. If you can see from the... If you can see from the diagram, the batter sends the ball to the receiver, either be it a roll, a throw, a bounce. Receiver gets it and kicks it away. After they kick it, they have to run around the cones as many times as they can. The fielder has to run and get the ball and bring it back and touch the cone. So you can play this in a hall. You can play it outside. You can have large numbers. It's excellent for decision-making. Um, can anyone answer me here? How is this game good for decision making? What decisions need to be made in this game? Yep, very good. Lots of good answers coming in. So the person with the ball has decisions to make. Where do they kick it to? What type of kick do they use? How far do they kick it? And then they have to have, have, they have to keep their eye on, on their, their partner as to how many times do I run around the cone. If you see through the through the rules, you get one point for every time you go around the cone. So you know, you're, you're working here on their, so their, their running, their agility, their turning, their twisting, which is all great fundamental movement skills to, to get into this game as well. Um, and I suppose they have to keep an eye to see where is the, where is the batter, how long will it take the batter to come back. So it's very good for, for estimating and that sort of stuff as well. A progression in this game that I would have always liked to add in is that when, when the person goes to receive the ball, they have to perform specific skills on the way back so obviously every four steps they must take a solo or they must take a bounce or if they're using a hurl or a bat they must be trying to balance or tap the ball in the bat so you're also able to to work on the person skills as well um but a very very good game um, and you, you do find the kids love it plus it really, really tires them out so it's very very good for for the aerobic side of things for them as well okay so next game then game over the river what type of game is this Okay, good stuff. So court game. Um, again, probably a, a firm favourite of, of games that kids love to play and anyone who's been in that in, in a PE environment, they all want to play over the river. Um, you'll see here, it's a, we've started with a 1v1 game. Um, it can be played 1v1 if, and then you can obviously progress the game up into a 5v5 or a, or a 6v6. Um, players must stay in their own zones. The ball must go over the river, which is a line of domes in the middle. Uh, again, the method of sending the ball, it can be throw, it can be kick, w whatever the level of the class or whatever the focus of your P session is for that day. Um, it's a competitive game. There's a scoring system in it. Um, say that you can see here and how to make it harder. The ball is not allowed to bounce. Maybe make them use their non-preferred hand or their non-preferred foot. Uh, make the river smaller. So just a question for you. What other principles of play can be coached? in when playing over the river so you'll see at the bottom here bottom left it's attacking and defending space so the person without the ball is trying obviously to defend the space in their in their area whenever you build it up to a 2v2 or a 3v3 game what other principles of play do you think can be coached Yeah, so teamwork is, is brilliant here, and yet we have to work as part of a team. Communication is key. So in, in any game, um, we, we're always wanting our players to communicate, and it's probably something that's very, very hard to get into a player. But if we can get our, our, our players from primary one age communicating, hopefully as they go through through the years, it'll stay with them. So coordination, target practice, spatial awareness, hitting the ball into space. 
Okay, very good. Um, support play is a principle of play that can be coached throughout this. If you're playing a 3v3 or a 4v4 um, over the river type game, a player has the ball, you can set a condition that the player who catches the ball must pass it to somebody else. So there's potty coming in, making runs after you've played the ball. Brilliant. So you can support the ball and get a pass from your teammate and then you play it over. You must move to a space after you play the ball. Okay, so you can, as you go up the ages, maybe more your primary six, primary seven, you could be starting to talk about support play, maybe the angle of a run, a wee bit of depth. So there are other principles of play that do come in, to, in, come in when, when you are playing this game. Very good. Right, we're just presentation slow on me here. So. The joys of modern technology. Okay, so again, just in the text box, we have a game here. What type of game is this? Okay, so brilliant. Target game. The two people, they're trying to do a bounce pass or an overhead bounce pass to try and hit a target. How to make it harder? You try and move back and you're making a further distance away. You have to estimate, you have to think of the weight of the pass, maybe the height of the pass. So there's lots and lots of different things that kids are having to decide on here without you actually having to coach them. Okay. In terms of our, our hand position for an overhead pass with big hands at the side of the ball and you're trying to throw the ball from behind your head um, if it's an overhead pass, side of the head pass, hold the ball at the side of the head and in front of the shoulder of the throwing hand. So you're trying to aim, throw the ball, hit in the hoop. So just another progression of a target game that we had seen earlier. Okay, so next game, team ball pass. Just in the text box, what type of game is team ball pass? <clears throat> Okay. So non-invasion game, very good. So team ball pass, you have a square set up, um, three or four people in the grid, and all they have to do is move whatever way they want inside the grid and pass the ball to each other. Now, anyone who's tried this game with a, with a group of kids, what you probably will be familiar with is they all run in a circle. So as a coach, do we let that go, or do we stop it? Do we ask the question? can't see the slide. Um, so as a, as a coach, what do we do? Do we let them run in a circle? Because it's not really what we want our kids to be doing in our games. So we, we should probably look to stop them. We should be looking to ask a question. Where is a good space to move to? See, there's people that are having issues. And, okay. Um, Again, very, very good for, as a, as a coach, to stand back and observe the player's movement on and off the ball. So what's the person doing off the ball? Are they standing still? Are they trying to move into a space? What's the person doing on the ball? Are they running with their head down? Are they looking for one of their teammates? And again, very, very good for communication, a game that won't work without communication. So in the game, you can set a challenge, first team to 10 passes without dropping the ball. Um, you can change it that you can number them all. Number one must pass to two, two to three, three to four, and so on. Um, in terms of coaching points, what you're looking them to do, 
I'd have always asked the kids to make sure you can see your partner's eyes before you throw the ball. When you're trying to receive the ball, big hands around the ball and body around the ball, body behind the ball, sorry. Okay. So this game, opposite corners, what type of game is opposite corners? Okay, brilliant. Full invasion game. So in this game, opposite corners, you have, you have two teams, you have four goals. So as you can see from the diagram, two blues in one corner and two red goals in the other corner. The red team are only allowed to score through the red goals. The blue team are only allowed to score through the blue, blue goal. So in this activity, we're focused on spatial awareness and the switching of play in attack. So again, depending on the, the ability level of your class, you can have it a 2v2 or move it up maybe to a 5v5 and um, there's loads and loads of coaching opportunities in this game you will find that the kids will maybe at the start of the game they'll all follow the ball they'll all follow the person on the ball and they're all congregated around the red goal and nobody has really caught on that they can score in in the other goal okay so that is a really really good opportunity if you do see that happening to come in with a coaching intervention pose a question question being what other goal can you score in? What other space can you move to? And hopefully with a couple of spot and fix um, and a couple of co coaching interventions, you will see the children starting to become more spatially aware. You will see them starting to move within the area that they're making themselves available for a pass. If you do find that they're not getting it, maybe, maybe some of the kids or the group that you're dealing with, maybe their spatial awareness isn't where it it should be or they're just not ready for that game so you probably have to regress a wee bit and, and work more on their spatial awareness through your warm-ups or maybe more simple games like team ball pass okay so next game tar ball what type of game is tar ball Okay, brilliant. Not so advanced coming in. So a target game. So how to play it. A cone in the middle with, with domes around the cone. The defender who is the, the, the non-coloured player in the, in the diagram, he's not allowed inside the cones. And the players on the outside are also not allowed inside the cones. Players on the outside have to pass the ball to each other and wait for an opportunity to try and hit or knock over the cone. So in this activity, we're developing the ability to work as a team and develop simple attacking and defending play. So already here, you're working on the principles of attack, support play, and um, the angle of a pass, running off the ball, and you're also working on the principles of the defense, on, or the start of principles of defensive play. So in the chat box, what instruction would you give to the defender? So just think about the defender and how that defender is gonna work against four or three players. What instruction would you give that defender to stop or to prevent the team knocking over the cone. Okay, watch the ball and keep moving. Don't dive in. Excellent, look at the body position. Don't follow the ball, cut off the space. Think about where the ball is going next. Excellent. So I suppose from a defensive point of view, you're asking the player always to be facing the ball. You, you never want to see that, that player turning their back on the ball. If they turn their back on the ball, that's a, a big opportunity as a, as a coach to come in and stop it and question the player as to if they turn the back, you know, what is the issue there, why they can't see the ball, etc. So you're looking to cut off the angle to the tower, low defensive position. So you're looking to focus on their foot position a nice uh, shoulder-width stance with their knees bent so they're able to, to move effectively. 
laterally move. You're looking them to the head up, eyes open, get their arms out so that they're they're narrowing the space either to the target or they're narrowing the space for the pass. Okay, so some great answers there. Well done. Okay, so the type of game we have here is <clears throat> yeah, brilliant, a field game. So another progression of the rounders we had earlier on. So the rounders earlier on in the presentation was a 1v1. This time, a game called Quick Rounders, where you've got four, four outfielders and one batter, three footballs. Um, fielders have to retrieve the three balls um, that the batter has kicked or the batter has thrown or has, has used something to strike out before the batter gets back. So the batter sends the three balls out and then runs around the cone and gets back to the line. So here we have a lot of there's anticipation um, Loads of decisions for the batter to make. Do I kick one way? Do I kick one long? Where, where do I kick the ball? Then have the decision to make. Are they brave enough to go for the green cone and try and get five points? Are they going to play it safe and maybe get in and out to the red cone two or three times to try and get, um, I say, just, just two or three points? So great game for um, spatial awareness, decision making, and then also team play. Um, we've got four outfielders and three footballs. So... The, one of the outfielders will not have a ball. There's nothing wrong with with one of their teammates passing to that person if they're in a better position. So again, the the outfielders then have responsibilities as to will do they kick the ball back, do they run it back. Um, so again, there's lo lots of different opportunities for them to make decisions throughout this game. Okay, type of game then scout ball. Okay, brilliant. So a court game. So a wee bit to go for the river. It's uh, two teams, a 3v3 with one scout on either team. So you can see from the diagram that one player from the team swaps over. Um, and the aim of the game is to try and get the ball over to the, to the opposition side or try and get the ball over to your teammate on the opposition side. So again, very, very good for movement off the ball, finding space either in front or behind or to the side of the players. Again, Good, good level of spatial awareness required for this game, having to look up and then make decisions as to do we go for one point and try and get the ball across the across the river to hit the hit the ground, or do we go for our player over there and maybe try and hit it to them and get two or three points? So, you know, if you see in the, in the rules here, you will see if you get the ball to your teammate on the opposite side of the court, you get two points. You will find the greedy player may always go for that option and go for the two points and they're not seeing the move of the more simple pass of just getting the ball into a free space on the other side to try and get a point so again there's loads and loads of coaching can take place throughout this game if you've seen that happen and that they were always trying to play the ball to the scout and they weren't going for the easy option and um, loads of questions you can ask the kids to try and develop their sense of decision making throughout this game and a lot of it in terms of picking the right option. Okay, so a game, rotate the defender. What type of game is this? This is our last game here, so. What type of game is rotate the defender? Okay, so a non-invasion game. So you'll see from the setup, there's a, a grid, four people on the outside, 
who have to stay on the outside and are only allowed to move in between their cones and we've got one defender in the middle so the defender on the inside they can move anywhere and they have to try and intercept the ball so a great game for developing um, lateral movement in our players so the person on the outside must be moving laterally so talking again about move support play and the angle of a run then into the angle of her pass. The pass has to be a good one with the player in the middle as a defender. So again, they're trying to close down the space. They're trying to close down their angle. And in terms of their body position, you know, having to work their feet, keep their head up, keep their eyes on the ball and try and stay big. Okay, so I have one more game, apologies. So last game then, this game is what type of game? Very good. So, oh, full invasion game. Captain's ball. So, we have two teams, four players in each team uh, with a bib at either side. Um, aim of the game, one player from each team is inside the hula hoop and you have to try and pass the ball and get the ball into your teammate in the hula hoop where you get a score from. So, full, full game, loads and loads of team play required in this game. Communication, support play, lots of decisions to make when to pass the ball, what type of pass, do I hold on to the ball? And again, in terms of, you can set that yourselves in terms of what condition you want to set on the game. But um, focus in this game is maintaining possession while moving forward to score. So a very, very hard thing to, to get across um, to kids that when they have the ball, they're able to move forward and, and, and move forward as a team. We don't just have the, have the dominant person moving forward on their own, getting so far and then looking around them and there's no, nobody coming to help them. Okay, so listen, examples of the games we're after going through, um, so from our target games, and, and these are all progressed on, so your partner ball to bounce ball to tar ball, over the river, prisoner ball, and scout ball, we just didn't go through prisoner ball, but we'll give an example of it, field game, continuous rounders and quick rounders, non-invasion games, team ball pass and rotate the defender, and full invasion games, opposite corners and captain's ball. Okay, there's just a couple of things, um, our key stage two coaches are, you may have already seen this, are releasing um, lessons to be done at home via our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll see here just the release date. So there's one released um, yesterday, Tuesday 19th of May. Um, sorry, the key stage one lesson, Tuesday 19th of May. And you'll see the following dates in. So it would be great if you could share these um, videos when they're released on YouTube with your, with the parents or with the other staff in your school and let them maybe get it out to the parents or via your school's social media channel if you could share the link when it becomes live. It's the key stage two coach that we can run the school. So that if, if, you, if the kids, if we have a coach in one of your schools, the kids will be familiar with the coach. Okay. Are there any questions? If anyone has any questions, if you want to put it in the text box, and I'll try my best to answer it. Thanks, Kieran. In terms of managing rounders games, um, it's a game I would have played a lot whenever I would have started the kicking, um, the kicking, I suppose, block whenever I was in, in schools. Um, I would have no issue playing it with 28, 30 kids in a hall. Um, again, there are going to be bumps and bruises, but I think if a child bumps into somebody once, well, it's if they learn from it. Um, you know, they're going to keep their head up the next time. But 
I, I never had an issue with, with working the, the Rounders games, um, whoever that question was there. In terms of PE with social distance, how do you see it unfolding? Um, again, I don't really know the answer to that, to be honest with you. It is something that we have talked about, or we are going to talk about in next week's webinar, which is on how to effectively plan a session. Um, we're going to look at ideas around how we or how our coaches can carry out PE lessons uh, if with social distance measures in place. Hopefully that answers. Are the key stage one less suitable for, for foundation stage? Yes, they're suitable for foundation stage. Okay. Okay, listen, just so um, in a 40 minute session, how many games would be recommended for key stage one? Um, well, I would probably always start with a game. Um, and in that game, I suppose I would always have a progression. So I'd start with the game, let them play the game for a bit, see how it's going, and um, break the game down into a smaller element where I'd let them practice their skills, be it in a individual capacity or in pairs, um, and then I'd put them back into a game that was going to challenge them um, on the first game, if, if they're able for it. So I would say maybe two games, um, plus 40 minutes, May it would depend if it's key stage one, if it's maybe primary one, you know, 40 minutes just might be a wee bit too long. 30 minute session, um, may be more applicable, but in terms of P3s, yeah, 40 minutes is probably probably a good length of time. But maybe, yeah, to answer that, two games, um, would be my own opinion on that one. Listen, there's a couple of resources here, um, will there be anything in place for key stage three P going forward? Um, again, I'm not sure, on, I'm not sure. Uh, could say on that on the answer to be honest with you, but I'll 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 speak to somebody and I'll come back to you on it. Um, listen, there's a couple of resources here if if you're not familiar with the GA Learning Portal, so learning.ga.ie. Um, if if you do have a bit of time now and you want to go on to that, it's a great resource where you'll find all of this information. Um, it allows you to plan different sessions. It gives you different sessions for all age groups, warm ups skill development ideas and games so it's a very very good um, resource and then our also ga youtube channel where we're, we're, we're constantly putting up new videos and stuff um for you said for, for teachers and parents and, and club coaches and stuff alike um and then lastly um, thanks very much say, for your for your attendance. Um, this, this, this is new to all of us, and thank you for the positive feedback. Hopefully, we got something out of it. Um, registration will be made available through Eventbrite. Hopefully, tomorrow, um, where say so you'll see the dates for the, for the rest of the workshops. Um, we are hope, due to the large numbers. We have just under three hundred people have registered for both workshops today. Um, we didn't really anticipate there to be as many. So we, we hope next week that we can have one workshop. We would, we'll try and go live and use a different system where we'll be able to cater for more people. We're probably stuck here with around 150 people, the 200 we can just cater for at, at the one time. So, so I, I will email everybody who registered for the first one the link for Eventbrite. Um, but again, it'll be sort of a first come, first serve in terms of, um, in terms of signing up. The first resource was learningga.ie. Where do you get the GA game cards at? There's a there's a manual called the Gaelic Start Manual. We will be mailing this out, and we will add a couple of other um, games cards in. But if if you are looking a if you are looking a copy of the Gaelic Start Manual, if you want to contact me directly, there there is a price attached to it, and we're, I'm not too sure if we have too many left. But um, if you are looking something like that, we come. Give me a shout and we'll try and work something out for you. So, listen, there's no other questions. Thank you very much. Um, I say we'll be in touch the next couple of days with the content of today's presentation and the slides.